The original scythes were made in Sheffield, Bell Broughton, probably around Newcastle, um, and other places in England over time, uh, were the crown scythes, which is this one. What crown scythe means is uh, the metal, the whole metal is uh, one solid piece as different from the rivet, two pieces of the blade and riveted back of the later uh, patent scythe. These scythes were made out of a sandwich of materials. There's the high carbon steel for the cutting edge of the blade, uh, the, that's the meat of the sandwich, the bread of the sandwich, to both top and bottom of that, as the uh, iron which gave it uh, uh, weight and strength to some degree, uh, the steel was for the cutting edge to retain a sharp edge, these three uh, materials were welded together under a, a power hammer, a water driven power hammer and drawn out to length and to width uh, in order to do that job, then they were hardened, tempered and then ground to shape. Well, not ground to shape, to ground to get a, a, a keen surface finish. Uh, this is the tang of the scythe, some people call it the crew, and that was so that it would fit the handle. This is a scythe handle, or snaff, mm -hmm. as it's called. It has two nibs, nubs, <coughs> nibs, that are um, can be attached to it at different angles to suit the... Uh, user, whether he's tall, short, or however he wants the relationship between one handle and the other. And that is, on, on this, is fastened this tank at this end here. And the hole is for that to go there. And what happens here is that that hook goes through that hole and this is known as the grass nail this is the grass nail and when mowing grass the grass tends to collect at the bottom end of the scythe blade and eventually if he hadn't got this it would end up in this area and uh, become uh, a collection that you don't want so this is actually a deflector to stop all this grass coming on this part down here uh, these were made in Sheffield up to the, just after the 1939-45 uh, war. Uh, there are at least, at least uh, three scythe forges in Sheffield, uh, certainly up to the First World War, when really the whole thing collapsed and uh, eventually only Ties with Sons and Turner were left actually making uh, those scythes after that period. This film was taken at Claywheels Lane, Claywheels Forge, Claywheels Lane in the 1940s. Um, and the scythe forger was a man called Bernard Moore. And he was third generation scythe forger. Uh, father and grandfather before him. And incidentally, he was the last generation. This shows you the interior, make it thinner and to the correct width. This is the crocodile. The crocodile is the guillotine shear that is constantly moving up and down for cutting off the bars of iron and steel to the correct length. A scythe, crown scythe blade is a sandwich of iron and steel in which the iron forms the bread and the steel is the meat of the sandwich which forms the cutting edge uh, that's sharp but rather brittle and in order to 
stiffen it up whilst it's in use, the wrought iron is welded to it so the, the pieces of metal become as one in the initial forging process. This is a fire that was very, very smoky. The idea being that really they didn't want the carbon to come out of the steel and uh, so, that, so that didn't happen. They had a very smoky furnace. They rub it in sand to help with the welding process and here you see him welding those pieces of metal together. Eventually you'll see that the end of the bars of metal are a lot thinner. They will form the tang or the part that fits under the wooden handle of the side eventually. So what we end up with is a long piece of steel with a, an end on it. The forgeman wells up half the metal together uh, because the tongs are around the other half. Uh, at the point known as the turn heat, the rest of the um, bar is put into the furnace, rubbed into the sand, brought out, and that in itself welded up. So one has a long piece of metal that is welded up solid, that is twice the length of a, the scythe blade. This will be cut in two. At this point, this piece of metal is known as a string. And again, you'll see that the end of the blade is reduced down to form the tang. He's just straightening the string of steel and here he is putting it on an upturned chisel and he hits it with the hammer which marks it where it has to be cut and then that mark is put into the crocodile shears and the steel is cut off. Then he has the two half pieces each of which will be plated to produce a scythe blade. Here the furnisman is rattling his fire. There are different positions within the furnace for whichever operation they are doing. A welding heat would require than the plating process. You will notice that this hammerhead goes at a much slower rate than the previous one. It was very much quicker uh, for welding. The plating process seems to have a dwell so that the hammerhead stays on the scythe blade just momentarily. And what it's doing is, is moving the metal out sideways, spreading it to give the blade more width and thinner. The back is still quite thick and eventually that will have a groove put down it known as a grist. Notice how as soon as one blade is uh, taken out the other one is put under straight away. Here is the process of putting the grist in the back. It's a long groove that runs down the back of all sides and that is in order to give the blade strength uh, without increasing its weight. And this used to be done by hand by these two forgemen. After that, the blade was hardened in whale oil because uh, of the 
temperature that they could put the steel in at without the oil setting on fire, which with other oils was so at that time. Later, the scythe blade was ground. And that shows a series of scythe blades that was being produced by Tysaks at that time. Those short ones are known as bramble scythes. The thinner long ones were grass scythes. Perhaps one shouldn't forget that um, we used to rely on the sickle and the scythe for all our daily bread. Without it, we couldn't eat. And I think that that is why Sheffield tools were so important, not only in this country, but the world over. cast iron parts of the water wheel were connected by very short wooden arms to isolate the rim from the heavy shock load as the cams engaged the tail collar. Besides hammers for steeling and plating, this wheel drove shears and a grindstone for truing the hammer tool. Water was taken off the Ram Alley brook at a weir and led to the mill by a leet a store of water was essential to meet the intermittent demand of these wheels, which was provided here by a bottle pond. At the end of the day, the hammer was gagged again by slipping a wooden block under it so that the tools could be removed. The anvil tool was removed. tool grindstone was put into gear. The tool was ground to restore its face to a smooth curve. The fan was shut down but there was still fire enough to heat a piece of iron, for he had another use for hot iron before he left for home at the end of the day.
by 1966, there was still one firm still producing scythes, but they were not in Sheffield. They were in Belbroughton, in Worcestershire. And one day, um, an appointment was made to go and see this company making scythes uh, in the ways uh, 25 years on from the previous one. By that time, instead of having four pieces of metal welded together, two pieces of iron and two pieces of steel, uh, by this time, just one piece of steel was considered good enough. And here we see part of the producing a string. But one can see the tang being uh, held by the tongs and the metal is being drawn out to length and section as required. Uh, and instead of water-driven hammers, these people are using mechanically powered hammers. Here is the newer plating process. This hammer is a mechanical form of the old water-driven hammer. They still used a wooden beam. And this man was plating out the blades. That is all he did. He didn't do the previous process, he just did the plating. And it was interesting to note, I'm talking to him, that he'd been taught his trade by Bernard Moore's grandfather, I think he said. There was a connection between the two families, the one in Sheffield and the one at Bell Broughton in Worcestershire. And when trade was bad at one place, they would go to the other to see if they could get work there. Again, you've got the very deadbeat blow, which spreads the metal sideways. You have a very quick movement by sitting on the swing seat and moving oneself about with, with uh, legs. You, one accommodates the, the length of a, even a 48 inch scythe blade very easily without moving or getting up at all, uh, reaching out to the furnace. This was the process of putting the grist in the scythe, the ribbed back, and again was done instead of two men's wielding hand hammers, was being done by a power hammer. Very deftly, very slick. Within two minutes of this film being shot, the man was drawing his fire out, he'd finished for the day, and again.